Hello and welcome to another episode of the Emil Varna podcast. Today, I'm joined by Lynn Malcolm, who is the author of this very fine book here, All in the Mind. Uh, the subtitle is Fascinating, Inspiring and Transformative Stories in the from the Forefront of Brain Science. And I've, I've been an avid listener of the All in the Mind podcast for quite some years. In fact, I remember when I was studying psychology, I was doing some, some casual work uh, at some, some laboring jobs and I had my earphones in and I had All in the Mind uh, playing in the background al alongside a few of the other podcasts <laughs> that I would listen to. Um, and then very recently, you've, you've uh, published your book with the same name, All in the Mind. And this, this is a, such a survey, a, a broad ranging survey of a lot of what you've covered in the podcast and condensed in book form. It is quite quite chunky though. So mm -hmm. for those who can see see the book that I'm holding now, it is quite chunky. It does have a lot of depth to it. And so I'm, I'm, I'm feeling very blessed to be joined mm -hmm. by Lynn today. Uh, thank you. Thank you for joining Thanks, me. Neil. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's my it's my pleasure. I, I've as I said before, I, I've been through about three quarters through your book and there are, it's just punctuated very nicely with many different stories of people who have, who have been through, well, many tricky things in their life, but also people who have been on the other side to study the way the brain works, the way that people adapt with experiences and how that what that means for us as readers or as people who, who are just going through life. Tell me, tell me about yourself, Lynn. How, when did you first get interested in exploring the mind and exploring uh, those, the things that we see in your book? Mm. Um, look, I guess I even, you know, for, as a young child, I was always fascinated by, people's um, experience, inner experience, uh, what it's like to be somebody else, what it's like to be in other people's shoes. Um, I, and, and especially through high school for some reason, well, I, I guess my focus at high school was um, more in the, in the science area um, than, the, than the arts area, but I was also loved sort of studying English and literature and stories in that way um, but I guess the, the school that I was at it steered me in the in the direction of, of focusing on science and so I guess that's why that's sort of when I became really interested in what is the science that tells us about the human experience and what are we learning over years and years and years about um, what goes on in our minds and our brains um so and and I guess my my parents the you know the way I was brought up my father was a very kind of science head um and uh, he was very logical and very patient and and plodding and logical and and that's where where I got I guess my my patience and interest in the science area but my mother was um, just a, a very lively, wonderful um, story, not just, but she was a very lively, wonderful storyteller. And she was absolutely fascinated in interacting with people and, um, you know, listening to other people's stories. So I think I sort of gleaned a bit of both from that. And I guess through high school, I'd sort of, you couldn't study psychology at high school, but um, I was always interested in those sorts of stories. And so that was when I decided that I would draw my interest in people and human experience um, in with my, my scientific fascination to do psychology at, um, at university. And, you know, that's where I started. And, um, and I guess I've, um, even though I, I didn't end up, I was planning to be a psychologist, um, but I didn't end up doing that. I went off and did other things. And, um, but my fascination with psychology has just remained with me ever since. Um, and I had the 
the wonderful uh, privilege and opportunity to bring my interest in, in science and psychology to my um, passion that, that evolved in communicating with people, communicating what I felt passionate about through radio, through broadcasting. This is a, a very succinct and encompassing description <laughs> of what brought you here today. And I think uh, just to have that mum being the great storyteller that she was and dad having that scientific bent and here comes Lynn and gleans through uh, a whole range of, well, this is, this is the way my parents see the world. This is what interests me and, and how you were able to maximize that in, in the way that you were able to communicate or be, be a science communicator. This is, this was mm. really uh, pivotal when it came to listening and learning a little bit more. I mean, going through my undergraduate, as I as I said before, you, you learn what you what you learn, what you're taught in the units. But then to have uh, podcasts there as well to just add to that knowledge bank, yeah, uh, is is huge. And what you did with all in the mind, in the way that you went about the very, the very human touch that that I I heard coming from you. Well, you wouldn't just get that scientific perspective. You would also interview people who have a lived experience. And then you would say, well, what, what are the practicalities of this? What does this mean for us as listeners? Uh, you, you were able to do that quite well. Thank you. I, I, it was a very much a priority for me, both in making the podcast, in, in being a science communicator, and later in the book, to bring the personal stories to people because I think that's really the way um, we learn from other people's personal experience. Um, but I also think it is a, it's a terrific way of, um, of really engaging people and, and helping to understand the science and understand the implications on people's lives because we can get the science you know, we get the study, but if we can't apply it in our lives or understand how it is applied, then it's not very useful. So I was very keen to keep those personal stories in the book. Mm. One of the personal stories that you you make reference to and that really brought my antennae up was the story uh, of, let me see, where is it? Uh, the Romanian, so Is Isidor Rukel, um, who who that was under the section of uh, post traumatic stress disorder, and I, I took a, an interest in this because my my family background is actually Romanian, and yes. my parents came here in Australia in the late eighties, and so a very very similar time to where all of what was happening in Romania back with that communist regime and uh, having interviewed uh, Isidod yourself and gotten to know his story a little bit with, with the Romanian orphanages and what that means for brain development and what that means practically for him growing up, having been adopted uh, is, is just remarkable. Uh, I, I'm thinking whenever I'm interviewing or whenever I'm I'm speaking with someone, there, there's got to be stories that just hit you more than others, Lynn. And I wonder, having looked at uh, at researching your book and and finding more about what you want to include and and not include, it almost be a culling process of what what can I include because I've got so much to to include. How did you choose the, yeah. the stories? It was uh, difficult, but I think in the end, I, it was a very intuitive sort of gut process for me. You know, I just sort of sat back and had a look, look at everything and just thought, wow, I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that person or that the contact with that person. Um, and so I just thought, well, if that's the way it struck me, then I can um, infuse that passion um, for, for others. I think um, with Isidore, Isidore um, I noticed, first of all, there was a, a book that came out that landed on my desk, um, and it was about the, the science of uh, brain development and how trauma affects the brain. 
and um, one of the authors was a, a renowned um, um, psycho uh, psychiatrist um, and uh, scientific researcher on the brain, Charles Nelson, and it was a very, very detailed um, look at the study that they did on this group of um, uh, Romanians who had become orphans um, during the 80s. And uh, I actually forget how I... So I just investigated and thought, wouldn't it be wonderful to talk to somebody who's come, come through that? Um, and um, I'd found Isidore Ricker. I, I just can't remember how I found him now, but I was just delighted when I made the attempt to, and he um, replied to me and said, yes, I'm very happy to, to talk to you. And, you know, to he told the most amazing sort of heart-wrenching story from when he was tiny in the, um, in the, the orphanage and he talked about the the sort of social interaction that he had with the other kids and and how how the health workers treated him and they even kind of realized that he was he was very much of a leader type character even you know as a kid and they used those uh, qualities of him to sort of help control well control the other kids but but he was he is such a, a, um, a compassionate man to this day and was very, very open and generous in explaining how he feels his brain has been affected by the abuse and neglect that he went through. And I'm still in touch with him to this day. I'm a Facebook friend. So um, it's that's been a very rewarding um experience and very generous for him to mm. share his experience like that because he's vulnerable of course you know um so you know like I, I can tell you a number of different the, the stories that have, that have really stood out for me in that regard um I guess that whole area of um trauma and how trauma affects us and our brains is, is a fascinating one. And I think that that area has really changed. The, the, our understanding of that area has really changed and progressed quite even in the, you know, mm. the nine, ten years that, that I've been doing the, the podcast. Um, I just find it so intriguing because it's not just, um, it, it's both a, a, um, a mind and a body impact. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a fantastic example of how absolutely interconnected the brain and the mind are. Um, and the other, one of the other stories that just um, absolutely stands up, out for me, I won't forget, is I did a, um, well, it was on the, uh, the condition of what is now known as um, dissociative identity disorder which used to be known as uh, multiple personality disorder. And I remember I'd sort of tell the, the story in the book of um, when I was at university sort of way back. Um, around that time, there was a, uh, a movie that came out um, that was starred um, Sally Field and it was about multiple personality disorder. And, um, and it was a, it sort of told the horrific story of... Um, of the trauma that she experienced um, in her family from her mother and how she developed these different personalities. Well, later, I was fascinated by that story, but later it did come out and, um, that 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 story was possibly um, a bit, um, wasn't completely valid and true. But that said, um, later the the when th this um, disorder started to be known as dissociative identity disorder, um, I came across a, a woman, Helena Kuchers, who agreed to talk to me about, about her disorder. And I, I interviewed her. Um, she had actually been through years and years and years of intensive therapy by the time mm. I spoke to her. 
Um, but I, unfortunately, I wasn't in person with her. She was um, interstate um, and we we talked online. But I'd read a little bit about her story and, and I couldn't believe when I started the conversation how amazingly kind of grounded and generous and calm um, she was that she started talking about, you know, I asked her about what the different um, um, sort of personalities, she pre preferred to call them, most people call them alters, which are these different personalities that step in as, as like a pr protection mechanism from um, earlier trauma. She likes to call them her parts. Mm. And, um, and I asked her about how many parts, she said, lost count, don't know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds. And I asked her to describe some of them. And there was this plethora of, of personalities that, you know, some, some wore glasses, some were great at sport, some hated sport, um, you know, some could speak a foreign language, some were really outgoing, some were, you know, shy and vulnerable. And, and she had names for them and had detailed explanation about these parts and I realized that was you know one of these things I just realized what an amazing um, thing the brain is to be able to develop this mechanism a protect protection mechanism from she, she had very early trauma no not well very early and, and it continued on for too many years um, from her family and she only and she thought life was she was fine everything was fine going fine but it was when she had children and the children were this pretty much the same age as she was when she um, experienced the, tr the trauma herself the abuse she started to feel a bit Mm, something's wrong, you know, I'm depressed, I'm anxious, I can't settle, and it started to emerge. And it was only, like, you know, she was in her 30s or something when she went to started to have therapy and to realise um, what this amazing protection mechanism had allowed her to get through. And then she went through, as I said, this intensive therapy, very clever therapy, um, to start to gradually integrate the personalities into one person. Well, do you and remember the, the name of that therapy? It, uh, it was done by um, Warwick um, Middleton is the psychiatrist. He works in a, a centre in Brisbane. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know whether he has... He calls it a particular variety of therapy, but it involved um, really uh, um, allowing the, the personalities, whenever they came up in the therapy session, to come in as separate entities, as people, and he would talk to the, the other personalities and get the other personalities to talk to him and to talk to the others, and he would just deal with them as they came up and as it was needed fascinating and um eventually um yeah she uh she pulled through mind you I I think um I think I might have made a mistake here that perhaps he mm. wasn't the one who treated her but he was the one who talked to me about the methods that they use because they um at this particular center um they do treat a lot of um, dissociative identity disorder um, and interestingly, in, in you know, she, yes, she would say now that she's fully integrated, but um, she, I asked her, how does that, how does that feel now? You know, and she actually, it's not, it, it, she misses some of those personalities because they're very much a part of her mm -hmm. and she's adjusted to it, but she misses them and she sees them as still you know, memories of them are still very important to her. And anyway, I was astounded by that. And then a couple of years later, uh, a book landed on my desk and it was called Hope Street by um, Rhonda Macken. 
And it was her story of this, having dissociative identity disorder, self-published, um, and I was fascinated and thought, oh, could this be true? And I read, I read the book really fast and and um, and just thought, um, wow, this this was the most horrific story that she told. That you know the abuse from her father um, from really early. Just you know, I could hardly bear to to read it. Um, and I thought, can this be true? And anyway, she came into the, the studio. She agreed to, you know, I decided to, to interview her and to listen to her. And um, she came into the studio and before we, her husband came in with her and before we went in to do the interview, she said, I just, um, I just want to ask you one thing before we start. Do you think I'm crazy? And it really took me aback, you know. And, well, actually, no. I said to her, no, I don't, because I've had this experience with uh, Kalina years before and I have learnt a lot about this disorder and, no, I don't think you're crazy. So we proceeded to do the interview and she was she was vulnerable but she was lovely and generous and told the whole complex story. She created this absolutely complex story um, um, uh, sort of pattern of, um, of personalities. And she, again, had hundreds and hundreds of them. And um, anyway, um, after we'd, we'd come out and uh, we went out to meet up with her husband again and she said, I just want to ask you one more thing. And I said, yeah, what's that? And she said, can I give you a hug? Because I want to thank you for listening and believing and, and that just really touched me. And I thought, wow, just think of all those other people out there experiencing so many different, well, having different inner experience to, to our, our, ourselves or to me um, and not being understood or listened to um, and taken seriously. So that those two experiences were really intriguing for me and, and important for me, I think. That was a, a really captivating summary of <laughs> these experiences. I, I think I, I can, from memory, and I may be mistaken here, but in, in those episodes around dissociative identity disorder, did you, was it covered that certain states and certain parts or certain alters would even have different biological markers, such as, uh, or even eyesight, different eyesight uh, yes. abilities and and uh, blood markers in, in certain ways. Is that correct? Uh, well, certainly uh, the way they described their different parts, yeah, there were people with different eyesight and um, different uh, capacities, um, mm. physical capacities. But I didn't go into, I didn't sort of look at the research around the markers or, you know, what had yeah. been tested. But that sounds intriguing as well. Yeah. It does. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. uh, one of the reasons I asked you about this particular therapy is because uh, it sounds very, very similar to a trauma memory processing therapy uh, called internal family systems therapy. Mm -hmm. And you cover in the book in the section around trauma, uh, Bessel van der Kolk's research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you, you'd had a conversation with, with van der Kolk and he's one of these, these uh, interesting individuals who is an exceptional clinician as well as, 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 well as a researcher, mm -hmm. which is which is an, an amazing combination. But he wrote a book, uh, I think it was back in 2017, called The Body Keeps the Score, yeah. where he does go into these these types of therapies for trauma but it the way that you described it uh, whether you use the word alters or personalities ifs internal family systems speaks about parts and the parts are uh it's very interesting it's not necessarily for dissociative identity disorder but just for individuals in general who want to get to know themselves so the the kind of understanding of you are more than the sum of your parts is is that 
is that conception behind this. And the more you understand these different parts of yourself, uh, the more we can come and bring them that back into a unity. Does that sound familiar to, to what yes. you're describing? Well, it does. And um, yes, again, uh, Bessel van der Kolk's uh, work is, was in, intriguing for me too. And, um, you know, that he's been, uh, you know, a bit unconventional and not, not everybody accepts his work on trauma. Um, but he highlights how important it is to um, take in the body and the mind in terms of treating trauma and and very often, and I think it's more and more accepted these days too, that it's not always the best thing to get people to tell their horrible story again and again or to, to go over it again and again. Um, and he tells some lovely s- s- stories around with children who've been abused to get them to do yoga, to play physical games, to, you know, and, and it's remarkable the way it pulls kids through um, and, and, and pulls people through. So it's just like, you know, combining the body and mind. Mm. The other thing that struck me when you were talking about that was um, I also did some work, some um, interviews, and it's in the book as well, about um, people who have auditory hallucinations mm. and, um, you know, hearing voices. And one of the um, the... the interviews that I did with um when I went I went to a like a um it was a seminar on um compassion for voice hearing and it I I interviewed a a woman who has had a long um experience of of hearing voices and um and she had had this sort of compassionate focused therapy for hearing voices and it's about actually listening to those voices yes often there um can be um very um uh aggressive and upsetting and very critical um not always though and um but um she started sort of having this compassion focused therapy so the idea is to sort of have compa- for her to develop compassion for her voices so understanding that those voices come from somewhere in her or perhaps somewhere in her past um, and there's a reason for them and they're even though it doesn't seem like it they're helping her in some way and if she can just have compassion for that then she can use them as parts of her to help her deal with the challenge that hearing the voices um, confronts her with. And, uh, you know, and I remember when I was interviewing her, she'd, she'd even kind of reveal that actually, you know, while you're interviewing me, these voices are saying this or that or being critical or trying to put me off track, but I understand what where they're coming from. And so I'm just letting, letting that go and, and focusing, just trying to focus on being compassionate for them, but... Um, also compassionate for me as myself to be able to have this conversation with you. So again, it's parts, parts of ourselves, and we all have them. Just that, that you know, they don't always come out as obviously, or we don't always talk about them, um, you know, in a, in an obvious way. I think it's a fascinating area. It's a, it's a remarkable because it, we we all I, I could I could say we get a sense when somebody says part of me feels this way but then there's another part of me that feels something completely different we Mm -hmm. all understand that that's representing different elements of who you are Mm -hmm. but then that's where it ends in common vernacular i think Mm -hmm. when from a therapeutic sense so when i'm guiding my clients through this kind of parts work i i really want to get a sense of where do they feel it at what at what part of their body and what do you, how do you feel towards that part of you and then and then if there's a, a sense of judgment that's there it's like if we tell that part of you that's judging this this part of your body to just take a step to the side for a moment and then go back to that feeling how do you feel towards it now oftentimes when they're able to do that they feel a lot of compassion and openness and curiosity towards these parts and so from a therapeutic lens, it seems that 
understanding these parts and how they manifest within the body and then their roles as well uh, is, is so important. And, and often when I speak these days, uh, after doing more of this work, I would, I would often include things like, oh, part of me feels this way, but there's also mm-hmm. another part that feels something completely different. Or mm. when I'm speaking with my children, it'd be like, oh, there's a part of you that feels like this. And there's another part that feels like that, that can really help soften this sense of judgment that we have about ourselves. Uh, mm. So I, I found, I, I saw that that rose a few times in the book, though it was never referred to as IFS in, in particular. So no. I was just curious to know, ah, is this what what they're drawing on or is there something something else? Mm, mm. Yeah, so I just just don't recall that he he gave it a particular name, but certainly he's probably drawing from some of that, yeah. It's it's Mm. remarkable. And I think Mm. uh, one of the things, to to touch on your point of the hearing voices um, phenomenon, is Mm. it is just fascinating to me that, an individual, the part of the brain within the left hemisphere, Broca's and Wernicke's area, which produce speech as well as comprehend speech, Mm. are very active when these voices are are speaking. So it's the person's, what that means for for an average person is you're actually hearing something as if you and me are speaking right now. That's right. And yeah, there's been studies on that and, and uh, under brain scanning when somebody's hearing voices. It's, yes, it's, it's the same mechanism that's ha- happening in your brain when we hear, you know, when, you know, you hear a voice that's sort of over there. Um, so that just even, you know, discovering that science through neuroscience is so important and so crucial and takes us such a long way into understanding other people's experience and therefore being able to support and help them through what they may find as, as challenging. It's, yeah, it's fascinating. Mm. It really is. And, and what, what you said reminded me of another topic that you cover in the book. Uh, I can't remember exactly what the, what the condition was, but it's a type of synesthesia where... Yeah where people feel other people's physical pain. And you, yes. you refer to a story about a physician uh, who had this condition. Can you tell our audience yeah. a little bit about that? Yeah. So it's mirror touch synesthesia, this one's called, because synesthesia is, is refers to um, uh, cross senses. You know, some people, um, uh, some people have the type of synesthesia where they hear colours um you know that they, they see sounds um and i you know one of the the um lovely interview that i did with a young girl who she was probably 10 um or amazingly sophisticated um sensitive young person you know and yet yeah, she had this whole world of um, seeing colours and she'd play a musical instrument and she'd see, she'd describe the shapes and the colours that had come past her head when she heard particular sounds and she associated um, colours to people. So I asked her, you know, what colour am I, you know? (laughs) And and she said, well, when I first, when I um, first my mother told me that we were going to go and talk to you and I saw photos of you. You know, you were, I can't forget what colour she said I was to start with, but, but she said, now that I'm talking to you, you're more a, a apricot colour or, you know, something. I just, and, and it was also real and she associated kind of colours with numbers and um, she had even had personalities for numbers. And so, but she was an amazingly intelligent right tuned in girl um and I, I'm just going to be interested so much in her as she grows older and how perhaps she'll incorporate this further into her creativity in her life uh, anyway so that's the the sort of more common synesthesia but then there is this thing called mirror touch synesthesia where it's a bit like, yes, we can have empathy for others. We can kind of, oh, yeah, 
I feel your pain or, you know, like, but um, these people actually feel physically the pain of others or they, and and um, I spoke to um, the author of a book who interviewed this, this physician in person and um, and she said, you know, she was like interviewing him and he, she, like he said that like she'd scratch her face while, while she was interviewing him and he'd said, oh, I can feel that, you know, I can feel that on my own face, you know, like, and he, anyway, yeah, what, what a profession to choose for someone who, who has mirror touch synesthesia, who's a GP and, and, you know, how you would imagine, you know, how unbearable that would be to to treat people who are sick or in pain or you know and feel it all themselves and you know and he said yes um it is on the other hand it makes me really powerful and uh, important because I can I can relate so so closely to my patient and therefore I can offer so much more to to helping them and, uh, and he, but he did describe, um, you know, is he going through breakups? Like he broke up with his boyfriend, and um, and he said it was just unbearable because I would feel his pain about the breakup as well as my own pain, you know, um, like it was real. Um, so he said that it took a lot, took a lot to to untangle. But it's it's like it's fascinating because it's like the the extreme example of um, of empathy, you know, feeling others' pain, but really feeling other people's pain. Very interesting. That's why I, th I think <clears throat> on the other side of many of these conditions, we get a better understanding of of our own, the way that we we just live through life. I mean, when it comes to to this mirror touch synesthesia, I, you did a very good job at, at linking that to empathy and how this is, is a physical manifestation of empathy at its extremes. It's mm -hmm. a very interesting point uh, that we wouldn't necessarily consider, but at the same time, it's a matter of this, this is what we're going through. Uh, there's another point, and I, and I actually want to read part of this out if you'd let me um and this was around anxiety because it does tie in quite well with what you've said about empathy this was a a researcher i think who was recalling her clients with anxiety or, or people that she's she's treated with anxiety she said really commonly i would find that these individuals have this deepest sense of empathy and beautiful and a beautiful analytical mind so deep thinkers, deep feelers. And so when we have a deeper sense of empathy, we are more likely to be aware of emotions in other people. So there's this, there's this kind of kindness and compassion that we can play out in individuals who experience anxiety more commonly. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I, I thought that that really did, that stood out quite well because uh, on the one side, you have mirror touch synesthesia where you have that physical manifestation you have you have anxiety on the other on the other end which is that sense of well oh, that impending there's something going to happen something negative and then if we relate that back to to human empathy and connecting with others uh, what are your thoughts around these these parallels yeah that yeah it's true it's interesting the um, empathy, but something else that comes up really much later in the book. So empathy is, yeah, feeling other people's pain. And and as I think it was uh, Jody Lounger that you were you were quoting, um, and, and she talks about, you know, people who are feeling this anxiety, they also often have this beautiful quality about them, this beautiful kind of empathetic compassion, uh, well, empathetic personality about them um but it, it can kind of really rope people into ruminating about other people's pain as well um whereas then then you get to the point of compassion compassion's different um empathy is really feeling you know or kind of yeah feeling other people's 
pain um, and that can lead to burnout, as we know, in the, in the care industry, caring industry. Um, you know, you can, you know, many people in the health profession can only go for so many years um, because they, they get stressed out and burnt out by other people's pain um, and they have to learn strategies to protect themselves and, and perhaps to sort of block off some of that because if you're no good if you're completely burnt out by other people's, you know, um, um, difficult um, lives. Um, but compassion is about hearing and um, being there and being beside people without taking it on as your own. Um, and and it's and it's kind of tied tied in, you know, compassion and kindness. And uh, in fact, you know, the way I decided to finish the book was really to sort of focus on um, throughout everything that I've looked at, and um, you know, it, um, in everybody that I'd interviewed and every topic that I'd looked at, one th thing that always seemed to come through so strongly was the power of human connection, the sort of human interaction one-to-one. -one. And, and that can be, um, you know, uh, researchers looking at um, sort of researching other people's um, uh, situations or in therapy, you would know this so well, um, that, that if, if there is not that like really um, genuine, authentic, human connection, even though you might have a theoretical base of this type of therapy or this type of therapy or this type of therapy, if there's not that really good, you know, one-to-one -one interaction, um, then it's not going to be nearly as effective. Um, so and even to the point where I interviewed um, um, Mathieu Ricard, who was, he was a, um, a biologist in, in France, but left and and, um, and went to um, become a, like a Buddhist monk, and uh, he did hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of um, of meditation, and has and now focuses. And he believes compassion is the is the answer to just about everything, the, the world's woes, you know. So um, I I feel like that's an extreme, and there are people who thankfully people who do take that extreme and lead in that way um, that you know can lead us to sort of yes empathy but even taking it further than that if we can stand by somebody and be compassionate for, towards somebody we can also act and be useful and helpful um, so it's an interesting it's an interesting um, area. And the other one um, that I interviewed in, uh, you know, I, I included in that section of the book was um, Ralph Kelly, who um, um, after he, he and his wife had the most terrible loss when his, his uh, I think it was his 17-year-old son, was um, killed in a, um, it was, in King's Cross, he got out of a cab and he was punched and almost killed instantly and just out of the blue, you know. And um, and then and the, the the family was just absolutely devastated and but decided that what we need more kindness, you know. If those sorts of things won't happen if if with there's more kindness in the world and so he started up this organization called stay kind and um he he uh, rallied around community um a community group that would go out and and walk the streets at night and um uh, give comfort and give shelter to to people who were you know homeless or um you know in, in difficult situations in their lives, just giving kindness and, and you know, you, volunteers would come and learn how to do this and, and, and give kindness and, and it's grown and grown and grown. And um, sadly, like 
few years after he started that, um, he lost his, they lost their other son to suicide. And they thought, oh, what, the, you know, what the hell we, you know, just got to give it. It's just all too much, you know. And then they said, no, like if there had have been more kindness, then these things wouldn't have happened and we just have to dedicate ourselves to, to trying to um, spread this kindness through, throughout the community. Um, so there are, there are lovely stories like that that, um, that just seem to reinforce, you know, all the, the stuff that I'd um, spoken about before and the, the people that I'd spoken to. And, and, and it's, it's um, alongside good scientific research is crucial, you know. It's a it's a hopeful message, Lynn. Mm -hmm. It's it's huge. I mean, as you as you say, it's it's quite a a sombrous feeling that we lose sight of. Often, oftentimes, we lose sight of the good in the world, and uh, and these initiatives just bring bring those back. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a the um, forgiveness project. There's a I don't know if you've heard of that one, but but mm. interviewing individuals who who have forgiven others mm. who have been terrible to them mm -hmm. uh, as as extreme as uh, people who have gone through the Rwandan uh, genocide for example and they they put people who who have lost their whole family members to to these uh, to individuals from other the other tribe the, the Tutsi and the, the Hutu at the time and then speaking through their their pain and and I mean that's that's extreme and that's extreme mm -hmm. it goes back to at least memories of these religious traditions that we have that love your enemy and do good to those who hurt you and mm -hmm. and uh, this stay kind uh, this giving kindness towards others it's, it's mm -hmm. a huge deal of being human isn't it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right, and and uh, I love that that um, what you know many um, researchers and scientists and academics um, have decided to, well, you know, devote themselves to finding out um, the science, you know, and progressing the science in in brain mind issues, um, but alongside that to. Um, they are actually many of the people that I've had the privilege of speaking to are so dedicated and um, uh, dedicated to making a difference to people's lives at the same time as doing this very pointy headed <laughs> neuroscience, you know. Um, so co combining those two is, uh, is, yeah, it holds a lot of hope, I think. And these these days, I think one person came to mind uh, that you you might have heard of Andrew Huberman, who is a neuroscientist out of Stanford in in the states, and he is one of these these cutting edge neuroscientists who's who's uh, investigating uh, stress response and a whole range of other things. But he's also he's got his own podcast, and he provides uh, practical steps and strategies to help individuals condense through all that science to make it what can you do practically towards uh, for yourself it's only when individuals are doing what what you've done over the years where you take take science condense it into into bits that are practical mm -hmm. and then you can connect with that we can really get a little bit better as a species mm -hmm. perhaps <laughs> yes I could speak with you for for a lot more. I think we've just literally scratched the surface of oh, yeah. some of the topics you cover in the book. Uh, there's so much more for those who are listening. Uh, if you'd like what you've heard today, All in the Mind by Lynn Malcolm is the book that you want to get your hands on. It, it was published in May at the, at the start of this month, wasn't it? In May, yes, just at the beginning yeah. of May. Mm -hmm. So, and you've you've worked on this book. I, I could tell for for quite some time, perhaps, um, put, yeah. pulling everything together. And mm -hmm. you've done a fantastic job. So, um, I feel honoured that you've you've come by to just share some of your passion today. And before we do end, though, Lynn, I just want to give you the opportunity to to end in which way you'd like to end. Uh, if there's anything that 
that I, I could have asked that I haven't asked or anything that you'd like to, to say to our audience, uh, this is a good opportunity to do that. Mm. Look, there, there are many stories that I could, um, you know, get, well, I'm very passionate about this, some of the, the stories in the book and, you know, I think you'd mentioned um, there's some lovely stories about memory and uh, there's uh, lovely stories about the brain and um, the music and the power of music um, and I'm more and more um, uh, convinced about how important it is to keep looking at the relationship between the body and the mind that you know we, we should be well past seeing as them as two separate identities there's so much and, and it seems to be reflected in almost everything that that we come across now. Um, but I guess, yeah, look, there's so much more, but I guess that I just wanted to really emphasize um, how privileged I've been to speak with so many amazing academics, scientists, researchers, medical professions, professionals, and the incredibly generous and authentic people who've spoken so beautifully about their own inner experience. And I would say every one of those people that have talked about their lived experience, they're doing it for the benefit of other people. And I'm, yeah, I'm overwhelmed with feeling privileged that I've been able to hear those people and allow those people to to um, give their message to others. Thank you very much for continuing to do so, Lynn. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and Emil. It's been lovely to talk to you.